Where does God's sovereignty and man's free will meet? Where does it find the groove in the road? Last week we talked about Jonah. And boy, Jonah was a good example for all of us. And I'm going to show you an example from a little different angle tonight that what I want to do is I want, I want you to see, let me, just, let me ask you this, how many of you guys see that, that to some degree in life you're at the mercies of other people's decisions? Have you noticed that? We can, we can say, you know, you brought all this on yourself, you know, but that's not always the case. I mean, sometimes we're at the mercies of the people around us on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, with our family, um, in, in, in marriages, and in all kinds of things. We're at the mercies of circumstances, of environments, of a lot of people deciding they're going to do this or do that, and, and we are in the fallout. And so this story tonight is so comforting and encouraging because it shows you how in the midst of a world that is filled with human beings operating in free will, getting to choose whatever they want to do, that we, the children of God, in the midst of it all, we, we rest in the arms of a sovereign God. I want to tell you this story about Joseph. And I know if you grew up in church, you already know the story of Joseph. And I know that you know the, the laundry list of terrible things that happened in his life. And some of you read books like From the Pit to the Palace. Anybody read that? From the Pit to the Palace. Oh, good, then I can preach on it and use that sermon title. And you all just think I'm just really witty. Um, Joseph, as in the son of Jacob, is one of the most in-your-face stories of God's sovereignty in the midst of man's free will that God could ever give, give us, even beyond the story of Jonah. So if you know the story, look, it's just like last week's story of, of, of Jonah. I told you there's a thousand different sermons in it, but we were just going to stay focused on sovereignty and free will. And that's what we're going to do with this story, too. It, it, it begins with the story of, of Jacob, and Jacob has a whole bunch of sons. Um, the 12 sons end up being the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah, see, you know your history. And it's a story of, of a man who had more than one wife. I guess he was a Mormon, evidently. <laughs> and his last wife um, bore him a son. And he looked at this son a little bit differently than the other sons that came from a couple different wives. Because it's like, oh, I got a bunch of sons by that wife and that wife. And, but this is my only son from this wife. And he really loved that son. And his name was Joseph. And... Joseph was a unique child. He had dreams. And um, he did seem to be set apart um, for some reason. His brothers didn't like him. First of all, they didn't like him because Joseph tended to be a little bit of a tattletale, it appears, in the story. And he would blow the whistle on his brothers when they were out in the fields tending the flocks and everybody wasn't you know, doing what they were supposed to do. So that's probably where it all started with his brothers despising him. Then when it kicked into high gear was when Jacob loved Joseph so much that the Bible says that Jacob made for Joseph a very special robe. We call it the what? Technicolor. The Technicolor robe. The Technicolor dream robe. <laughs> we call it the coat of many colors. The Bible never talks about the colors or anything. It just says that it was heavily adorned. That's all that it says. It was a very beautiful robe, heavily adorned, and it was very richly ornated, the Bible says. And, um, and that just really set the brothers off even more. Well, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, Joseph has a dream. And in the dream, you've got... Uh, 11 sheaves of, uh, from the bindings of, of a wheat or something, and they're bowing down to this other sheaf. And uh, when Joseph can't keep his big mouth shut, he's got to run and tell his brothers, guess what I dreamed? And it becomes crystal clear that um, the dream would be interpreted that 
day the brothers would be bowing down to Joseph someday. Oh my goodness. They despised him even more. I had another dream about that. His father got wind of it. And, and uh, it, just, it, it tends to be a lot of drama, it appears, in the family. So one day, the sons are all out tending the sheep in a distant field. And Jacob has been, I guess, set in a position by his father to be um, the guy to go and check up on the brothers from time to time. Because he knows that Joseph will come back and tell him the truth of what's going on. So he goes to find his brothers. Um, he looks for them where they were supposed to be. They weren't there. There's someone in the field says, oh, they moved over to this field over here. And he goes to that field, and the Bible says from a distance that his brothers saw him coming, and instantly they just begin to burn with anger. <clears throat> and they begin to plot against Joseph. And they said, let's kill him. And the oldest brother, Reuben's like, we can't kill him. He's our flesh and blood. You know, you can't do that. And the other brothers are like, no, we're going to kill him. But he gets there, and there's a dry well, a cistern. We don't use that terminology anymore. It was a dry well. And they came up with this plan while Reuben wasn't looking to throw um, Joseph into the dry well. Clearly something he could not get out of. And then when the dust clears on that moment a little bit, they don't know what to do uh, because they've got to go home and tell Daddy Jacob something. And this is a, this is a, this is a culture where the patriarch is held in high position, high esteem. If you're a son, you don't dare defy Dad. Um, so they had to come up with some good. So they, they killed the goat and they splattered the blood all over the richly ornate robe. And they took it home and said, Dad, you're not going to believe this, because <laughs> we don't. <laughs> um, and they come up with a story that we found this. He must have been killed by a wild animal. And, uh, of course, in the, in, the, in the meantime with all this process, the Ishlamites, who, funny enough, were actually distant cousins of Jacob and his family, they, they come along, and um, the brothers decide they're going to sell Joseph into slavery, sell him to the Ishlamites. The Ishlamites were not slave owners. They were slave traders. And so that's when they did that. They came home with the bloody robe. Jacob is led to believe that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Terrible stuff, isn't it? He has fallen victim to other people's free will. Things he could not control. Things he couldn't do anything about. He's really, for the most part, trying to do the right thing. Even when he kind of tells on his brothers, it's just because he tends to have a managerial heart and he's, he's very much at one with his father. What is his father's is his also. And he's really just looking out for his father and his father's um, hurts. And here he is just trying to do the right thing, be a good person. He loves his father. There's no reason to believe he doesn't love his brothers, but now he's fallen victim to his brother's choices. The Ishmaelites take him to Egypt, which, by the way, uh, it appears in this story that where they were living in Cana, and you'll begin to put some other stories together with this before we leave here this evening. They're living in Cana. This is the first time that uh, the people who would become Israel, they're not Israel yet, but Jacob's name was changed by God to Israel as 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. They're not a nation yet. They're just really a big family is all they are right now. But they're living in Cana because that's where Abraham took um, his family and planted them there. And Cana is just, as you know from a story further down the road, just right outside of Egypt. So the Ishmaelites, um, they're slave traders, and they take probably not just Joseph, but other um, people too, to Egypt to sell them as slaves because Egypt was the, the primary market for slaves. They were using the slaves to build the pyramids and all kinds of other crazy things. And so the Ishmaelites take Joseph and they sell him. And he is sold to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar 
Um, when you look into the story, try to figure, you know he's, he's got a high position. He's one of Pharaoh's main people. But when you look deeper in the story, you find out literally what he was. He was a general. He was one of the primary generals in the Egyptian army. And, he, and Pharaoh held him in high esteem. And Potiphar bought him and took him home. And I want to read in Genesis 39, just verses 1 through 3. Here's what happened when Potiphar bought him as a slave, owned him, and took him home. So now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And I want you to begin to see something here. Early on, that we, the children of God, were thrown out there in life we're, we're victims to circumstances that have been created by other people, um, other people's choices. We're having to swim in the ripple effect of it. This is a very unfair thing that has happened. It, 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 in the old churches, we say the devil's trying to destroy him. And when you get to the end of the story, we might actually could honestly read that in there to some degree. Although the devil clearly is not really the one in charge of this. Guess who's in charge of this scenario, in the natural at least? Man. Man and his free will and his choices. So now he's in, a, in a, a terrible situation. Who wants to be a slave? Who wants to be owned by somebody else? But even in that situation, what I want you to see is what Potiphar saw, that even in that situation, Potiphar could see that, that Joseph's God was with him and that Joseph's God favored him him. And because of that, there instantly became a ripple effect. And suddenly, Potiphar is favoring Joseph. It's terrible to be a slave, but, but he has been promoted. He's head of Potiphar's household. I don't know how big a deal that is in Egyptian culture, but I suspect it was a very big deal because he's a high-ranking official. And so there he is. He's prospering as far as a slave goes, he's living pretty good. In fact, he's living technically much better than he would have in Cana as far as the clothes he's wearing, the house that he's living in, the clothes that he's eating. He probably gets to attend a lot of fancy banquets. Um, well, it appears from the story that, that uh, Joe was a pretty good-looking guy. <laughs> and Potiphar's wife uh, began to eyeball him and take a liking to him. And she tried to seduce him. One day when Potiphar was out and about, she called for Joseph, and Joseph, I guess, comes into, it sounds like maybe her bedroom, and he, she basically says, here's what I want with you. <laughs> He's like, I cannot do this, I will not do this, I will not betray my master, this is not who I am. Like, once again, Joseph's trying to do the right thing. He's using his free will to do the right thing. He turns to leave the room. She grabs his robe, pulls it off. He takes off running. Now she's humiliated because she's been rejected by a slave. Who does this guy think he is? So she's so humiliated and embarrassed, although nobody would have ever known except for Joseph, that when Potiphar comes home, she accuses Joseph of attempting to rape her and says, look, right here is his outer garment. It's right here in my bedroom. How else would have that gotten in here? Potiphar goes ballistic. And he has Joseph thrown into the king's prison. And the king's prison wasn't the commoner's prison. Um, the king's prison was kind of like our white collar prisons, probably where they sit. Uh, excuse me, where they should send a lot of senators and congressmen and people like that. <laughs> um, and it was, it was a, a prison designed just for people who were in the inner circle of Pharaoh's kingdom. Um, anyone that was on staff or, 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 or 
they were working for the king or for the government in some way or a government official. This was a prison designed just for them, and it probably was a little better prison than the commoner's prison, but it's still prison. So now here he is. Once again, God is stepping in with his sovereignty. He's blessing Joseph despite his unfair circumstances. He's making lemonade in Joseph's life. Um, and then he turns around, and once again, somebody uses their free will, and Joseph is having to swim in the aftermath again. And now he's in prison. He's went from, from the dry well to being a slave to now being in prison. It was a very unfair thing. But if we look at Genesis 39, verse 20, even though... <coughs> He progressively is being treated unfairly because of other people's free will. It doesn't change anything on God's end, and it can't seem to outmuscle God's sovereignty in Joseph's life. It says in verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. God's trying to show us something in this story when it comes to his sovereignty in the midst of a free choice, a free will world, that it doesn't matter who does what. God's sovereignty steps in and he prospers his children. Everything that happens to Joseph, he ends up getting promoted. He ends up finding favor with, with a slave owner. He's finding, he's finding favor now with the warden. In fact, if you read this, if you listen to this, Joseph has technically become the warden. It says the warden didn't even pay any attention to the prison anymore. He left everything under Joseph's control. Well, one day, two new inmates showed up in prison, in the king's prison. It was the king's pharaoh's cupbearer and pharaoh's baker. I don't know what these guys did to set him off. The cupbearer is exactly what it says. The king has a special cup. He has a special cup bearer that brings the king his special cup. It's just a thing of honor, and uh, it was common in those cultures. And um, I tried to start that at home with Hannah being my cup bearer. Be my water bottle bearer. <laughs> Something happened. The cup bearer is in the king's prison now, and the baker, that must have been some bad fudge or something to end up in prison. So, the cup bearer and the baker, both on the same night, have dreams. And they wake up and they're puzzled by the dreams and one of them is more than puzzled, he's worried. He doesn't feel good about it. They go to Joseph because Joseph has a reputation. He's a very wise individual, that's why he keeps getting promoted. They come to Joseph to see if Joseph, from what they've heard about Joseph and his God, is there any way that you can Tell us what these dreams mean. So he listens to the cupbearer's dream, and he says, oh, yeah, well, that's a really good dream. And what that means is, is um, that in three days, you're going to find favor with the king, and you're going to be back serving him again as his cupbearer. And the cupbearer's like, wow, I hope you know what you're talking about. That sounds awesome. And then the baker says, what about me? What about my dream? He says, oh, in three days, you're going to find favor with the king. He's going to let you out also, and then he's going to cut your head off. <laughs> um, well, three days later, they let out. It's Pharaoh's birthday, and their attendance at the, at the birthday party in some way. And sure enough, the cupbearer is reinstated and put back in his original position. And sure enough, the baker don't know if he just did something bad again. Or a Pharaoh, just when he saw him, it's just like it stirred stuff back up again. Oh, that fudge. I'll never forget that fudge. Kill him. <laughs> sure enough, he kills the baker. <laughs> Doesn't this sound like a 
Aesop's tale or something. <laughs> the stories of the Bible are so awesome. So, Joseph is still the warden in the prison. And now it's two years later. And Pharaoh has a dream. And it's an unsettling dream. And he, he has to find the translation for this dream. He calls his wisest attendants, his soothsayers and his seers and his magi. And it just he calls them all there and he tells them the dream. And what say you? What does this mean? And nobody had an answer. Now, when Joseph told the cupbearer what his dream meant, he said, you are going to get set free. And all I ask is that someday at the right place at the right time, you remember me and you show me favor and you'll know what to do when the time is right. Well, sure enough, two years later, the time is right. The favor is trying to find the interpretation of this dream and nobody has it. And the cupbearer is right there at the king's side all the time. He says, he says, Pharaoh, I know somebody that can interpret your dream. He interpreted my dream and the baker's dream. He was right on with both of them. And he told him the dreams and how they even came to pass. And Pharaoh says, go get him. So they go get Joseph out of prison, and Pharaoh tells him his dream. He says, basically, you know, I had a dream, and there were seven fat cows that came out of the river Nile, and they were grazing by the river, and all of a sudden these seven really skinny cows came out, and they ate the seven fat cows. <laughs> Joseph doesn't have to pray about it. He doesn't have to seek the Lord because God had been with him the whole time. He said, Pharaoh, here's what your, your dream means. Um, you're getting ready to have seven years of famine. And I think I can't remember some of the numbers now, but I think it was going to be about three years when this was supposed to kick in. There was a second dream. The dream um, was interpreted exactly the same way to confirm to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh would know he just didn't have bad fudge that night. This thing is for real. So he, um, he is very moved by Joseph. And he sees the wisdom and he sees everybody in this country with multiple gods that does not serve the God of heaven and earth, as Israel called him. They're all seeing that this one God of Joseph's seemingly is a pretty good God. And he gives favor to Joseph no matter what situation Joseph is in. Well, he tells Joseph, um, you're going to be my governor. You're going to be the highest official in the land outside of me. In fact, he basically did what the warden did. He said, I'm checking out. I'm going to sit on my big chair. I'm going to be a figurehead. You're going to run Egypt. Okay. I know it's an extreme story. But he's in all kinds of terrible circumstances based on other people's choices God comes in, promotes him straight from the prison to the palace. There's no in-between. I know that's extreme, but what is it that God wants us to see in that? That even in a, in a scenario that we go, oh, this is so unfair, and I didn't... Uh, oh, Lord, why is all these bad things happening to me? It goes to show you that, that if you can see God's sovereign hand trying to work in your life, there's quick promotions and there's big promotions. God can transfer you from here to there so fast. So it's like a three-year period, something like that, and he puts a, a plan in place. Pharaoh tells Joseph, you know, you come up with a plan. You come up with a system. You put it in place to, to save us through these seven years of famine. And so that's exactly what, what Joseph does. He has this plan, and as they begin to plant and they begin to harvest, he takes a certain percentage, tithes off of the harvest, and he puts in certain silos, and he stores it up, and he stores it up, and he stores it up. And when famine hits, guess what? Egypt has plenty of grain. It wasn't just Egypt in famine, though. It was the whole region all around Egypt, including Canaan. And The Bible doesn't really talk about this, but if you were here last week and the week before when we read from Isaiah about this God who creates prosperity and creates disaster, and you watched this play out in the life of Jonah last week, 
Who would you say incited this famine? Do you think it was the devil or do you think it was God? God's trying to get some people's attention. He's trying to relocate some people from here to here as the story begins to unfold. So Cain is in famine and they're starving. The primary family that lives in Cana, there's all kinds of Midianites and Ishlamites and all kinds of people around that area. But the spotlight is on Jacob's family, right? Israel, that will become a great nation, and they're starving. And so Jacob gets a collection of his sons together. He says, look, you need to go to Egypt. Here's some silver. Um, they had money. They weren't poor. They had money. They just didn't have food. They gave him silver and said, you need to go to Egypt. You need to buy grain. So the brothers load up. They go to Egypt to buy grain. But who should they have to stand before? Joseph, of course. He's the one that makes all of these decisions for Egypt. Well, they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph kind of recognized them and said, wait a minute. Y'all look familiar. Then they begin to talk because they were, they were afraid. They were very nervous. The brothers were very nervous just in that setting. They're in a different land. They're unsure. It's a different language. Joseph begins to hear them talk. Um, in their Hebrew language, and the, the brothers just assume that nobody there can understand what they're saying, but Joseph understands every word they're saying, and he's hearing them confess what they did to him. And they're saying, they're going, we're in this mess, we have no food, and this, we brought this on ourselves because we, we sold our brother into slavery. Without the foggiest, if they're standing right there before that brother that they're talking about. Well, first, Joseph is very, very mad. But as he hears them talk about it, and especially with Reuben with some remorse, his heart is softened. He gives them all the grain they can carry. He also tells his attendants, take the silver that they just paid me, put it back in the sacks. He just didn't even want to take payment from them. He sent them home. Oh, of course, before that, he began to ask them, is there another brother? Is this all there is? What he was trying to get to is, was there another brother you're not telling me about? Like me, it's me! <laughs> I said, oh no, there is another brother. He's by our father's last wife, and he's the youngest brother. Well, Joseph really didn't know that much about him, if anything at all. He said, yeah, he's, he's Benjamin. He's the young brother. And uh, so Joseph comes up with this plan. It's like, okay, um, I want to meet this brother. I said, well, he's our father's youngest, and our father's very... Uh, very much favors him, just like he had been favoring Joseph. And uh, he won't let him travel with us. Joseph wants to meet him. He's also testing him in multiple areas. He says, I want to meet this, this other brother, and I want you to go back home, and I want you to get him, and I want you to bring him back here. And I'm going to take ah, this brother, Simeon. I'm going to take him, and I'm going to put him in prison and hold him here until you bring this younger brother back for me to meet. Well, nobody's happy about it, but Simeon gets thrown in prison. The rest of the brothers take the grain. They go back home. They open their bags. Everyone's ready to have a party. They find the silver in there. They think this is something fishy. It's been duped. Uh, this great official in Egypt is going to think that we took our money back and never actually paid for it. Uh, we'll never be able to go back there again. And, and they, they tell Jacob the whole story, and Jacob's like, oh, this is terrible. What have you guys done here? And, and it's like he's upset about sending them in prison, but at the same time, he's not even remotely open to sending Benjamin back there because he's scared to death. The same thing that happened to, to Joseph will happen to Benjamin. Um, I take it that that last wife, he must have loved a little bit more or something because the two kids, he was very taken to those two boys. Well, time passes. Uh, I think it's actually been in a couple years or so. And they, they, need, they need grain. They have no choice but, but to go back. And they go back, and they have to stand before Joseph again. And they say, by the way, here's the silver for more grain. And here's the other silver. We never did spend it. We don't know how it ended up back in our bags, and we're very sorry. Um, and so, and by the way, here's our younger brother, Benjamin, if you'd like to meet him. They go through this whole process again. Long story short, he lets Simeon go. Um, he gives them grain. They start heading back home. But Joseph, uh, Joseph is instructed when he attends to take a silver cup, the king's 
cup that the cup bearer would normally give him to drink from and hide it in his sack of grain that he was carrying. He was setting them up. So they take the grain, they start home, and before they even get out of Egypt, uh, the police catch up to them. They said, we need to see your bags right now. Someone has stolen the king's cup. And they open the bags, and it's, it's in Benjamin's bag. And, of course, they're all taken back there, and they're all scared to death, and they're crying. And they're all bowed down before Joseph. Just like in the dream. They're bowing down. They're basically worshiping him. And they're begging and they're pleading with him. Joseph, at this point, is very, very touched. Um, Genesis 45. I want to read that. Genesis 45, beginning at verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God's sovereignty invading, infiltrating human will to accomplish things in the future that we can't even begin to imagine in the moment. What kind of faith does it take to trust and rest in God's sovereignty? For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he goes down the story and begins to explain to them more of the details of what has happened. How often have you and I ever done that when we become the victims of other people's choices? How often have we been able to look back in the rear view mirror and see the bigger picture and say, yeah, this, this really wasn't you that did this to me. This was the sovereignty of God in play here. Now, this, those guys still use their free will. They still did what they chose to do. I don't completely understand where that thin line is with, with free will and God's sovereignty. And I'm one that, to assume people like, like Judas. He, was going to, he made the decision he made. It was all on him. But God, in his foreknowledge, he knows what people are going to do. And he inserts those choices into his plans of sovereignty is, is really the only thing we can, we can see in this. So, he has said, even beyond what he understands in the moment, said, God sent me ahead of you to save you, to preserve you. He didn't even know at this point how to speak about the bigger picture because what he was literally doing was saving the nation of Israel. If there were no Joseph thrown in the pit, sold into slavery, falsely accused, thrown in prison, becoming the official that he was in Egypt. If none of that would have happened, there would have been no salvation for Israel. There would have been no Israel. Jacob and his family would have died in Canaan. He didn't even understand it was even bigger than what he realized. And I want to I read this punchline in Genesis 50, the, the part that's probably the most familiar to a lot of you that grew up in church. It's one of the greatest scriptures on God's sovereignty in the Bible. Genesis 50, this is the very end where, uh, where Jacob has his family together. He wants to bless his sons. Jacob is, 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 is ready to die. Um, he, in fact, he has died. Now that he's dead, his brothers are scared. Since daddy's dead, there's no one to keep Joseph from killing us now. Verse 19 says, But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. 
millions of lives, actually. How many of you guys know there's a place called Israel? How many millions of Jews have there been on planet Earth since this story? I want you to understand, not one single one of those Jews would probably have ever existed without this story. The nation of Israel would not exist today without this story. This is the people that became a nation, that, that, that became a land that birthed the Savior of creation, that saved us. Do you understand the ripple effect into one story about one person's life? That's the sign of your God. Now, the old language here, um, I think it's King James, says what the enemy has meant for destruction, the Lord has meant for good. And that's how a lot of you all heard this verse. And that's why I said, well, maybe you could read a little bit of the devil into it. The devil got into those boys or something that was still the boy's choice. All right, let's see how old you are. How many, how many ever watched uh, uh, Flip Wilson? How many knows who Flip Wilson is besides us three? <laughs> what was his famous line? The devil made me do it. No. The devil can't make you do anything. God's not going to make you do anything either. It completely flies in the face of his whole system of love. So this translation is a little more pure probably in that it's not pointing fingers at some general enemy. But we now can take that and put that in the context of general enemies. Whatever any enemy in your life, I don't care if it is the devil, anyone who's against you, rises up against you, plots against you, sabotages you, calls you bad names, posts lies about you on Facebook, tells lies about you on the WVBA website. <laughs> Talks about you on topics. That was a bunch of years ago. The good thing is nobody with any kind of moral character at all ever read topics, so I didn't care what anybody thought about that. Uh, I hope nobody here just had to say, ouch. Because that was harsh. <laughs> um, doesn't matter who's done what. Are you a child of God? Is your God the God of Joseph, even under, even before an old covenant, but it wasn't even a new covenant. It was just, it was just God being God to His children. That's what I like about these stories. It's pre-Moses, just barely pre-Moses, and it's just God showing how He is with His kids. It's like I don't care who does what to you. What the enemy means for bad, I'm going to turn for good. We're going to make lemonade, and this is going to be much bigger than you. I'm going to do things in people's lives, generations down the road through this, through your life in this, and you don't even realize it. Now, you've never put all the pieces of the story together here. Um, <coughs> Joseph brought Jacob and his brothers where to live through the next five years of famine? Egypt. Guess what happened then? They never left. <laughs> they just started kicking babies out left and right. I mean, these sons had took on many wives and they just started making babies and their babies started making babies and the babies after that started making babies and just a few generations later, there's Jesus, yes. Well, this, this is true. If we keep going, yes. Jesus is always in the mix somewhere, isn't he? And before you know, there's like two million of them. And that's when the next Pharaoh gets very concerned and he says, man, we got to do something. They're getting out of control. Let's start killing the baby boys and try to get the population, you know, ranked in here. And that was when Moses came on the scene and, and the whole uh, being delivered from Egypt, the Exodus. That's when the story of Exodus picks up. But it all started because Joseph brought his father Jacob and his brothers um, to Egypt to live. All right, do you see God's sovereignty in that? Do you? Despite who did what, who said what, who planned what, who plotted what, how big the enemies are, how powerful the enemies are, how many the enemies are. All right, how many finally saw um, the hump day vlog today? 
I don't know what was going on today. I don't know if it was Facebook or my phone. I battled that thing. I kept trying to load it on the Cornerstone Family Church page. And when it finally started to load, load, and I had like 10 of the same video on there, boom, boom, boom. And I started saying, oh, my gosh. And I started trying to delete them. And I was deleting so many, it locked up on me and said, we can no longer operate in this way. You've just got to stop. It, we just were not getting along well at all today. I ask that because that means that you've heard this verse today already used in a different context for different reasons because it is a great passage on optimism because if God is in it, good is in it. This is the one scripture that completely encapsulates the whole story of Joseph that we just told. Romans 8, 28. One of them that most of us know. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let me give context called to his purpose because we're probably going to jump in picking this up here next week because I want you all to understand where this scary little term predestination works into God's sovereignty. It's been misused sometimes through the years. And, and then other churches are just completely bypass it and say, we ain't going to touch that. I, well, we're going to touch it. I want you to see what's going on. I want you to know that um, the context is those that have been called according to his purpose, do you know who that is? His sons. But only the ones he foreknew. And God can't foreknow everybody, can he? Just a few. For the ones that God would call his children, his children, Knowing that we are in our feeble way trying to figure out how to love him. We know that our love pales compared to his love for us. Expressing our love to him is awkward on the best days. Because we can't see him, but he can see us. It makes it difficult. It's not like another human being. So we know that in all things, all things, all things, all things, your brother's selling you out, lying on you throwing you into a pit, being sold into slavery, being lied on, falsely accused. It doesn't matter what happens in all things. God's sovereignty is in the middle of it, working those things for good. Now, as I've looked at this fresh again today, with a fresh heart, I, I have understood that, that this passage, this passage this passage has been used probably more maybe than any other passage in the Bible to bring comfort to people going through hard times. Has it not? Well, all things work together for good. That's as much as we quote, but that's enough, right? All things work together for good. For who? For the children of God. Not just for everybody, for the children of God. And I have realized that 99% of all the comfort that I ever will need to find in life is found in the reality of this verse, which is demonstrated in that story that we just told. If I can honestly find the faith every day of my life, I don't care what I'm battling. How many here has ever been sick? How many here ever chose to be sick? So you were a victim of something, right? That you didn't choose. Well, we may not have taken care of ourselves. We may have brought it on ourselves in some way. But we still didn't really choose it. Nobody wants to be sick. Not normal people, anyway. I get, I've heard there are some people out there that enjoy that kind of thing. I, but in all things. In all things. Bad circumstances at work, on your job. Things falling apart in your family. A stupid Kia that needs a quart of oil every time you put a tank of gas in it that, thank God, is gone and been delivered. <laughs> you, I just told my wife the other day, it's like, I, I try not to burden it. It's like, they have no idea in the last year um, what a stress that car was to me. That I felt like we couldn't go anywhere with any confidence that I could get them there. And Hannah was needing to go here and go there and social studies fairs. And it's like, and I'm too cheap to drive the Hummer because it gets 15 miles a gallon. So I'd rather risk breaking down in that oil guzzling Kia than to 
put gas in the Hummer. I'd rather put oil in the Kia. I, I did the math on it. It was costing more to drive the Kia. Now I know. Ever have those days where something breaks down in your house and you, and you know that's not going to be the only thing because it always comes in threes? And you've learned with wisdom to never say, what else can go wrong? Don't say it. Because God's like, well, there's a multiplicity of things here. You know, where, where should we go from here? Uh, all things. All things. You know, we have fun with, we, we haven't really been a church that's went through a lot of heavy stuff here. We've had some sad deaths, but we haven't really had what, what we call tragedies like, like we saw not far from where you guys live just yesterday. Um, but we've had some, some little battles here. We've had some things we've had to get through as a church family. There'd be a few that would leave here and there, but for the most part, the family would draw together. And um, if there was an enemy behind it, it, it's always backfired in the enemy's face every single time. And I like to have fun with that whole little thing with WVBA. And, and, uh, but oh my gosh, it opened a brand new door of unity in this house. I, w I wouldn't take anything for that Sunday that we couldn't have church because of a drunk hitting our power pole. I tried to find out who it was so I could win them to Jesus, but they, they wouldn't tell me. I watched the police blotter, and two months later, I saw something in there, and it still didn't have his name. He knew somebody in high places, and I, and I don't think it was God. <laughs> okay, so did God, did God make that guy get drunk that night? Of course not. Did God grab the steering wheel and run into that power pole and clip it off and where we would have no power Sunday morning? Of course not. I went to Cracker Barrel that morning because there was nothing else to do. I love the biscuits and gravy there. I was miserable the whole time because I'm thinking, we should be at church right now. I had a sermon that was burning in my spirit. It's like, man, I was needing to unpack that thing. and That's probably been one of the most single by far most beneficial Sundays in the history of this church. I was moved. The way you guys rallied around me, defended me. I mean, I'm used to defending you guys because that's normal. Pastors protect the sheep. But I got a lot of pastor buddies and I've just been listening to their stories and it doesn't sound like that's as common for the sheep to protect the shepherd. <laughs> Boy, you guys did. God has blessed our socks off because of it. I, I, I keep playing off of my recent circumstances because it's still, it's still fresh in me. Um, I do not want to ever get shingles again, especially on my forehead and in my eyeball, especially. I, I'm, I'm still battling stuff. There's good days, there's bad days. And, and, and I'm trying now to wean myself off, off of neurotin, Rotten is not a painkiller. It doesn't make you feel good. You don't feel anything when you take it. Um, you just feel it when you stop taking it. Because your nerve endings just start going bonkers again. And you feel like you, whatever the injury was or the surgery, whatever it is, that's damaged nerves, um, that they give you neurotin to help calm those nerves, um, you don't realize, you think, oh, I'm all better now. And you try to go off neurotin, and it's like everything's like, mm -hmm. and it's like, you just feel like you're right back there where you were at, even though you look in the mirror and you go, well, there's no shingles there, but I sure feel like there is. And I've been, I've just been tired of battling. Um, everything's got side effects, right? And some of the side effects have just been catching up with me the last few weeks, and it's just like, and I, and I don't like it at all. And I don't like any part of this whole thing. But God has used that season to take me into places that I know personally and even for this church, if you were here Sunday, as we've kind of kicked open a door, I just, I know that I would have never gotten into this season to see things that God is trying to show me about people, how God sees people. Me, the grace preacher, everyone should see people the way I do. I didn't realize just how unlike God that I was. And how I see people. I didn't, I, I hate 
when people become judgmental. I didn't realize how judgmental I was. Sometimes you gotta have the high karate slap. Also, if you're old enough to know what I'm talking about. Thanks, I needed that. How many besides me and the siblings know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't like seasons of suffering, but I do understand now why Paul said that he took great joy in his sufferings, because that's a ridiculous statement. Only a crazy person would say that. I take great joy in my suffering. <laughs> 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 No. Uh, I'm going to myself. Please, because I'm not alone. <laughs> but, you know, Dustin and I were talking on the way home on Monday from her doctor's office. You know, thank God for dealing with me. You know, and one thing is judgmental. You know, in times past, I, I was so judgmental, and I don't know if I was, you know, how I, but I would be prideful, boastful, and I would say, you know, when somebody was going through something, I'd say, well, you just need to get up and get over there. But I wasn't in their shoes, and I was just trying to do it on the faith of, you know, I know what the Word says, you need to just get up over there. Well, I went through some things in my life a couple of years ago, and it slapped me in the face. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I learned a lot. Yeah. And I'm still learning. But we gotta, we can't be judgmental, because when somebody's going through something, if you've never been through it, you don't know what they're That's about. right. That's when you right. do go through things, you learn from these things, and you can Don't you find it easier to show grace to certain kinds of people once you've needed that same grace? You want to open a new season of God in your life? <clears throat> Just say this to somebody that's going through something with a little bit of smart aleck in your tone. Well, where's your faith? I don't know where theirs is, but you better be finding yours because you just kicked the door open on something. You better hold on tight. Seasons are good for us. They're very good for us. They're not pleasant. I don't want to have to go through things. I want everything to be cotton candy and, and black licorice, if you all like that. We're black licorice family, and, but not that Twizzler stuff. That's not real licorice. That's a joke. <laughs> not a Twizzler. Really. That's not real licorice. So, am I right? We three know. That's not real <laughs> You young people and your Twizzlers. Okay, so Abraham Lincoln, early in the Civil War, meets with a bunch of pastors at a prayer breakfast. He said, Mr. President, we're going to pray that God is on our side. And he stopped them quickly. He said, sirs, we better pray that we get on God's side. Abraham Lincoln was not a church-going guy. He, he was very unorthodox in his faith, but it seems like he had faith and that he had somewhat of a handle on the sovereignty of God. And he understood that you can have your opinions, I can have my opinions, your side, my side, but there's God and God has a side. And we better figure out where his side's at and we better get on it. What have we said now for the last two weeks going tonight? We're trying to learn about man's free will and the sovereignty of God so we can learn how to align our free will with God's sovereignty. And the more that we learn how to do that, the better our life is going to be. Would you agree with that? I want you to take this story of Joseph home with you. And I want you to take this Romans 8, 28, and I want you to, to try to daily apply it to your lives with everything that goes on. I know, look, some of us grew up in church where we were taught that give your heart to Jesus and nothing bad will ever happen. He'll bless your socks off every day. And if bad things happen, it must be because there's sin in your life or you've been disobedient or something. Uh, meanwhile, if you've read the stories of the Bible that God chose and he kind of liked them and thought they had some good qualities and he chose them to go do some special things, all hell was breaking loose in their lives, much worse than you and I can relate to. 
A lot of it's just life. Some of it were subject to other people's free will and their decisions. And some of it is the ripple effect, like Jonah last week, from our own choices. But if we'll humbly yield ourselves and yield our will to God, oh, can he ever make lemonade. And you will not be an exception to that. I promise you. So, Father, tonight, really, Lord, help us to take this story home with us and apply it. Father, I, I really do find great rest and great comfort in your sovereignty. Whether it be my life individually, my family's life, I look at my daughter and, 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 and her whole future that I, I, I worry about sometimes, and, and I, I wonder about where we're going as a, as a local church. I wonder about our nation. I wonder about this world. Lord, I rest in your sovereignty because you're finishing what you started. And many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's your plans and purpose that prevails. I praise you for your sovereignty. Help us, Lord, to hide this in our heart and make it foundation in our lives. All right. Were you all okay Sunday morning? Y'all are back here tonight. I, I guess you were okay. <laughs> We'll come back this Sunday. Buckle up. I promise you, even though we're going to plow into a little, a little bit of a different direction into this reckless love of God with this amazing grace of His, you're probably going to laugh some Sunday as we talk about life under an old covenant. Um, but I think it's going to be very, very, very eye-opening. And it's going to be very liberating. It's going to set some people free. All right? All right. Can you handle the truth? All right, then I'll see you soon.